Hey team, welcome back. In today's video, we're talking about solutions to linear systems. For example, here's a linear system, three equations, three unknowns. When we say we want the solution, really what we mean is we want the values of x, y, and z that make these three equations true. If we want to solve that, we know we have methods already. We could do a substitution method, which is uh, we, we would take one and solve it for a variable, plug it into another equation, solve for a different variable. That approach gets tedious very quickly, even for a system with just three equations, um, cumbersome. We could also do a Newton-Raphson method. We know that Newton-Raphson can be used on systems where f of x is equal to zero. And we could simply take these bias terms on the right side, move them to the left, that makes a system equal to zero. There are other methods that we could use though. Uh, in today's video, we're gonna talk about two methods. We will do Kramer's rule, and we will do Gauss-Jordan. Now, there's a second video we're going to do on solutions to linear systems, and we're gonna do two more, uh, two more methods. There will be the Jacobi, and then the Gauss-Seidel. So when we are done, uh, you will have uh, five methods and then a, a terrible uh, masochistic manual method as well. Now, uh, these are all methods that, uh, that work on linear systems, but what about nonlinear systems? What if we had these equations and we had, very simply, uh, an x squared in just one of the equations. That makes the entire system nonlinear. Well, which of these methods then can be extended to nonlinear systems? You could um, theoretically use a substitution method if you really wanted to. Uh, you could definitely use newton raphson uh, which we have done in a previous lab. You cannot use Kramer's rule, and you cannot use Gauss-Jordan. Uh, Kramer's rule and Gauss-Jordan are explicitly for linear systems only. You can use Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel. And we'll go into some, uh, obviously we'll go into details about the applications of Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel when we do those discussions. Um, but personal opinion, if you're going to be using, uh, if you're doing nonlinear systems, a newton raphson is probably the, the best approach. Uh, however, you can have success with Jacobi's and Gauss-Seidel's. Okay, uh, if we want to, uh, if we want to start with Kramer's rule and Gauss-Jordan, uh, what we want to do is we would like to take this system. I'm going to remove this little nonlinearity. We need to take this system and represent it with linear algebra. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the three unknowns x, y, z, and I'm going to extract them to the right and I'm going to take the remaining coefficients and put them in a matrix. Uh, this system is three equations and three unknowns, so this is a three by three system. We would expect, at the end of this, a three by three coefficient matrix. So one, four, nine, uh, 25, 36, 49, 81, 100, 121. This is multiplied by a vector of the unknowns, x, y, and z. And then on the right side, we have the vector of bias terms, 16, 64, and 144. This is the coefficient matrix for this explicit system. Uh, just realize that you can do this same uh, approach for any linear system. Uh, we could think of this first term as a11, the coefficient in the first row and the first column. Uh, the 9 would be A13, first row, third column. And in the bottom right corner, I'm going to call this one ANN. You will have the nth equation, the nth row, and the nth coefficient aligning it with the nth unknown. So we can expand these methods to uh, n number of equations. Okay, uh, I'm gonna clean this up. Let's get started with Kramer's rule. 
Kramer's rule uses the determinant of the coefficient matrix, which for a three by three system, this is how you calculate it. What is the computational cost though of performing this determinant calculation? Well, there's all of these terms. Inside of each term, we have to perform multiplications, and then there is the addition and subtraction of all the terms together to get the final answer. So how many terms are there? Well, this is a three by three. There's going to be n factorial number of terms, three factorial six. Inside of each of these terms, there's n minus one multiplications. So this number, n factorial multiplied by n minus one, this is how many multiplications you have to perform. There's also the additions and subtractions. Well, there's six terms here, and we have to perform five addition subtractions. So let's say uh, n factorial minus one additions and subtractions. Okay, let's keep this in mind as we move forward. Let's show now how we use determinants in Cramer's rule. Suppose we have this system. It's two by two, and we can represent it with AX equals B. Kramer's rule is gonna solve for the two unknowns, X1 and X2 individually. We're going to take the determinant of a modified coefficient matrix, and then we're going to divide by the determinant of the original coefficient matrix. In order to do these modifications, to solve for X1, we're going to remove the first column, and we're going to replace it with these bias terms, so B1 and B2. To solve for x2, we're going to remove the second column, b1 and b2. And that will give us our solutions. Now, we did talk about the computational cost of each individual determinant. How many determinants do we need? Well, they're all divided by the determinant of a, so you perform that only once. And then we have n more, so there are n plus 1 number of determinants that we need to calculate. After we calculate all these determinants, there's also divisions. So there are n number of divisions. Okay, let's, uh, I'm gonna clean this up and let's take all of these computational costs and put them together. Here's the final computational cost. We said there were n plus one total determinants. For each determinant, we had this many multiplications. We had this many addition and subtractions, and then at the end, we also had n divisions. So is, uh, is this a lot? Well, let's focus just on the multiplications. Suppose that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a table. Suppose that n is the number of, is the dimensions uh, for two, three, four, and 10, for example, uh, I'm gonna write cost. And really what I'm doing is I'm just listing the number of multiplications that have to be performed. Uh, here is that cost, six, 48, 360, and for n equals 10, the number is 359,251,000. Two hundred. Now, uh, this is clearly the, uh, the the part of the equation that that blows up the fastest, uh, and it's going to dominate. It's going to dwarf the number of addition subtractions, and of course, the number of divisions just scales linearly with dimension. So, uh, for n equals ten, there's ten additional divisions, which uh, effectively means nothing. This is this is the part of the computational cost that is is obviously the worst. Um, what all of this means is that Kramer's rule is useful if you're at the pub with friends and you need to uh, solve maybe a two by two system, right? It's, it's about the limit of the usefulness of Kramer's rule. Uh, I don't even have an assignment on the lab where you have to use Kramer's rule. Okay, uh, so that's uh, fun. Let's move on and let's talk about the Gauss-Jordan. The Gauss-Jordan elimination method we usually just call it matrix inversion. Suppose you have some matrix A, it's square, dimensions are n by n, and if you are able to find another matrix A inverse, same size, n by n, such that when you multiply these together, you get 
an identity matrix. And when I say identity matrix, I mean that there are just ones on the diagonals and everything else is zero. This matrix is, uh, it's the linear version of one. So uh, if we were going to express this same process in scalar form, this would be like taking uh, a number A and multiplying by one over A. That's the, the scalar equivalent of what we're doing now. We can leverage this matrix inversion. Uh, if we have a linear system, AX equals B, what if we multiply both sides of this with A inverse? Okay, so A inverse A times X equals A inverse B. Well, A inverse A is an identity matrix, which is linear version of one. So what we're left with is X is equal to A inverse multiplied by B. Suppose we wanted to implement this matrix inversion in MATLAB. There's actually two different syntaxes we could use. First, we could say X is equal to inverse of A multiplied by B. Second, we could say X equals A and then slash B. Now, both of these will give you the same answer. They are actually doing two different things under the hood though. Uh, both of them are Gauss-Jordan elimination techniques. In the first approach, you explicitly find the inverse of A. This quantity inverse of A, it's an n by n matrix. And then you take this and you multiply it by the n by 1 vector of B. So there's two processes. First, the inversion, and then matrix vector multiplication. In the second approach, this is actually a single command in which the system is solved for the unknowns all at once. You never explicitly find the inverse of A. Now, MATLAB takes care of all of that computation for you. You just have to know the syntax. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to dive in and I'm going to show you what is actually happening when you perform this. And the example we're going to do is going to be the second. I'll show you how to set up the first one if you're interested, uh, but we're going to do the second because the second is actually more computationally efficient. What you have to do in your lab is you have to code, well, you could code this one if you want, but I expect you to code what's actually happening when you perform this process. The fact that it's built into MATLAB means once you're done, you can use MATLAB to check your answer. Here's how we set the problem up. Suppose we have this system three by three. We're going to combine the coefficient matrix and the bias terms to form an extended coefficient matrix three by four. Now I've drawn the red line just to show the distinction between the two. It is all the same matrix. The goal is to take this three by four matrix and use a series of linear operations on the rows. And we would like it to yield an identity matrix on the left. And if you can turn the left into the identity matrix, the right-hand side will become the solutions. So that's the uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination method that we're going to work through, and we're going to do an example step-by-step. Step. Um, I did talk about, though, what, uh, what about that inverse command, if you want to explicitly find the inverse of a matrix? Well, in that case, you do not put the bias terms in, what you do instead is you put identity on the right side. So if this is a three by three, I need a three by three of identity. And now the goal, you still turn the left side into an identity matrix. So I'm going to put identity on the left. And once you turn the left side, into the identity matrix, the right-hand side becomes A inverse. And then you simply extract uh, that A inverse. Now, notice the extended coefficient matrix is larger, which means when you perform all of these linear operations, you're actually performing it on more terms. And the output of this whole process is just the inverse, which means you then have to perform the matrix vector uh, multiplication. So, uh, that's why the other method, where we simply solve the system all at once, is faster. Okay, 
Let's clean this up and uh, let's get started with a worked example. Here's the example we're going to do. Three by three system, three unknowns. Remember, how do you begin? You begin by forming the extended coefficient matrix from these coefficients combined with the bias terms. So here's that, uh, that coefficient matrix, two, negative one, one, two, negative one, three, 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 two, one, four, one. Okay, and remember, the goal is to convert the left side, let's put that division, the goal is to turn the left side into identity, and then we'll be left with the solutions on the right side. Okay, uh, so here's how we're going to approach this. We're going to take it one row at a time. So we're going to we're going to start with row number one. If this row were identity, what what would it look like? It would be a one, and then a zero, and then a zero. So let's make this first coefficient be one. How can we do that? Well. Right now it's a two. Uh, what happens if you take equation number one or row number one and we divide row number one by two? Well, that's a, just a linear operation on an equation. We can do that. Uh, clearly this first leading term is going to become a one. Uh, then we'll have, here's a one. This one will be one half, one half, and then the two becomes a one. Okay, next. Uh, so we, we've taken care of that leading one. What about the first column? If this is an identity matrix, what does this first column look like? Well, this is going to be a one, and then this would be a zero, and this would be a zero. So uh, what can we do to make this negative one become zero? Well, notice that we've, we've made this, uh, this first entry a one. What if we took equation number two and we added equation number one? So take the first two equations and add them together and then replace the second row with that equation. Okay, well that, that's gonna make it one plus one equals zero, right? So uh, let's do that. And if you do that, here is what you get, zero, 5 over 2, 7 over 2, and 4. Next, we want the 2 to be 0. How can we make this 2 to be 0? Well, we have a 1 in this column. Uh, so let's take equation number 3 and let's subtract 2 times equation number 1. Take this row, multiply it by 2 and then subtract that from the third row. If you do that, here's what you get. This becomes zero, two, three, and negative one. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to repeat this procedure all the way through. And I'm, we're gonna do it, I'm gonna show you the math, but remember you have to program this. So how are you going to approach this in code? I'm going to give you the pseudocode when we're done, but just be aware that there is some kind of looping structure where you're going to loop over some index, right? And that index is uh, you start with the first row, you normalize that first row by the first term, and then you use it to eliminate everything else in the first column. Next, we're going to do the second row. We're going to normalize the second row by the second term. We're going to use that term to eliminate the, uh, these coefficients in the rest of the column. Okay, so how do we normalize row number two? Well, we want to make this term be one, so we divide by that number. If you take five over two and you divide by five over two, you get one. So let's divide the whole row by five over two. Well, this leading term is zero, so that remains zero, and here's what you get. Uh, 1 and 7 over 5 and 8 over 5. All right, uh, next, 
we need to use this one to make this two and this negative one half become zero. Uh, so let's take care of the first row. Let's take equation number one and we're going to add to it uh, one half of equation number two. Now, equation number two has a zero in front, so you multiply this by one half and add it to the one, the one remains unchanged. Uh, but it does affect the rest of these terms. So when we do that, these next terms become zero, six over five, and then nine over five. Okay, next. We want to eliminate the zero. Uh, let's take equation number three and let's subtract two times equation number two. So the zero multiplied by two is zero. This remains unchanged. Uh, we're gonna get a negative two and then we add them together. So this next equation, uh, zero, one over five, and then negative uh, this is 21 over 5. Okay, again, you need to put this into code. This is a looping structure. We did the first row. We took care of the first column. We did the second row. We took care of the second column. We have to do the third. Clearly, we're going to divide the whole row by one-fifth. When you divide one-fifth by one-fifth, you get one, and then... This simply becomes negative 21. We need to make these terms in the third column be zero. Uh, so let's take equation number one and we're going to subtract six over five multiplied by equation number three. And uh, I'll go ahead and give you equation two as well. We're gonna take equation two and we're going to subtract seven over five multiplied by equation number three. All right, when you do that, this is what these terms become. These will become zero, and this last column, we will have 27 and 31. So what does this mean? This means your x's, your solutions, I'll just write them here on the left, uh, x1 is 27, and x2 is 31, and x3 is negative 21. Okay, uh, you have to do this on lab number 10. Um, I'm about to give you the pseudocode, but again, just to highlight, you can very easily check your answer because you can program this into MATLAB and let MATLAB do it for you. Remember that you can take uh, matrix A and you can define it using your coefficients, and then you can very quickly solve for X by using this syntax, or remember there was the other syntax, uh, you can do inverse of A multiplied by B. Uh, just be aware that that is more computationally expensive. Okay, uh, I'm gonna clean this up and then that process that we just did, it makes sense when you look at it and it makes sense when you do it by hand. Let's put it into a pseudo code so that you can program it. Let's start just by defining the terms. So number one, uh, define the extended coefficient matrix. Next, number two. Number two is um, just to make sure that the process is going to work, uh, ensure or check, uh, ensure that no diagonal terms Are zero and of course you have to you have to do this because you're going to divide by the diagonal terms um, so how do you ensure that well you just rearrange the matrix if there is an equation that has the diagonal term where it's zero you just swap it with a different equation next 
Um, <clears throat> so we're going to uh, we're going to make the uh, II term right. So II is your diagonal. The II term one by normalizing rho i. So really, we, we saw that in practice, right? Really, that just means you divide the entire row i by the i i term, and that's going to make that term equal 1. Next, number 4. Uh, we're going to use row i uh, to make all other terms in column i zero. Next, uh, we're going to set i equal to i plus one, which really means that we're going to iterate, right? You're just going to increase the counter and then six, uh, repeat. We need to repeat three, four, and five. So let's say, uh, I'm just going to say repeat steps three through five uh, until, of course, um, i equals n, until you're effectively done. Okay, uh, so uh, this is it for Gauss-Jordan. Um, recognize that uh, if, you've, if you've ever been doing anything with matrices, uh, matrix inversion, you've actually been using Gauss-Jordan elimination just without knowing it. Um, now your task is to just go program a Gauss-Jordan solver. Okay, uh, so that's it for now. We're going to come back with another video later. And in the next video, we're going to talk about uh, Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel methods.